Hello. In this section, we're going to think about memory. Uh, we're going to think about three key areas of memory. We're going to talk about the different types of memory, where a memory is stored, and finally, we're going to think a little bit about how memories are stored. And we're not going to look at memory in great detail, but we're just going to really focus on, on the highlights. So the first thing we need to think about is how we might be able to classify memory. Are there different types of memory that the brain can store? And it is the case that there are two broad classes of memories. There are the so-called declarative memories and the so-called non-declarative memories. Declarative memories, otherwise known as explicit memories or memories for facts, are the kinds of memories uh, that you as medical students are all very familiar with. So here we've got a student studying um, chemistry and she is using her declarative memory to learn a whole load of explicit facts about various things. Conversely, non-declarative or implicit memory is memory relating to either motor skills or emotions. So it's said that you never forget how to ride a bike uh, and so this lady here um, is recalling non-declarative or implicit memories about how she should ride that bike. Another good example of non-declarative memories, juggling for example. So those are the two broad types of memory that we have. And the interesting thing is that these two types of memory do tend to be stored in different regions of the brain and so therefore they can be differentially affected in different types of brain damage. So where are these memories stored? <clears throat> well, it's quite an interesting story, actually. The guy on the left-hand side of this figure is a guy called Carl Lashley, who was an American physiologist in the early half of the 20th century. And Lashley was very interested in um, whereabouts in the nervous system memories are stored. And, and he did a rather grisly experiment. Um, he took rats and trained them to negotiate a maze. And then what he proceeded to do was to remove parts of the rat's brains, gradually removing more and more. The idea being that if the maze, or rather if the map of the maze, if you like, was stored in a single well-defined area within the rat's brain, then if you removed that it would completely lose that skill. However, what Lashley discovered was that you had to remove huge amounts of these rats' brains in order for their skill in maze navigation to be significantly affected. And he concluded from this that memories are presumably stored in a distributed fashion uh, throughout large regions of the brain. So, what, so, for example, one particular fact that you learn as a medical student is not stored just in one area here on your brain, it's actually stored as part of a distributed network of neuronal connections. So that was the conclusion that Lashley came to, and that's what we think is the case um, in these modern times. Now, the two different types of memory, as we said, are stored in two different brain regions. <clears throat> the um, explicit memories, the memories of facts, tend to be stored within the cerebral cortex. Okay, so we're talking about long-term memory here. So the long-term memories are stored, um, relating to factual information, are stored within the cerebral cortex, as we said, in a distributed fashion. Whereas the implicit uh, non-declarative or memories for motor skills are stored in regions such as the cerebellum but also the basal ganglia. Now quite a good example of this is if we look at certain patients who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. These patients might lose a lot of their ability to lay down new memory and they might start to lose a lot of the factual content of their memories. Um, and that tells us that Alzheimer's disease affects the cerebral cortex. However, many of us have seen um, patients with dementia who still retain fine motor skills. For example, I've seen patients with dementia who can still play a piano, for example. So these fine motor skills are stored in regions such as the cerebellum, which tend to be less severely affected in pathologies such as Alzheimer's. So this does definitely reflect... Um, the different functions of these brain regions. <clears throat> now how are these memories stored? Well in order to think about memory storage we've got to think about the two 
broad um, types of memory, regardless of the content. We have short-term memory, which lasts typically seconds to minutes. And we have long-term memory, which can last up to a lifetime. Now, short-term memory we can think of as a bit like um, a, an echo within this cave. So there's a person there stood at the bottom of the cave, and you can imagine them shouting and getting an echo reverberating off the walls of the cave. And that lasts for a few seconds. Short-term memory is like that. It's a reverberation of neural circuits, just storing that information just long enough for you to decide what to do with it. If you want to convert short-term memory to long-term memory, you need to go through a process called consolidation. Long-term memory, as we said, can last up to a lifetime, and we can think of it as a bit like storage on this old-fashioned tape recorder, where we've got these ma electromagnetic changes within the tape, um, and that is laid down then and stored potentially for a lifetime. But of course, long-term memories, we know, can degrade. Consolidation, the process of consolidation, i.e. the way that we convert short-term memory to long-term memory, um, is a very important process. And it's a process that you as students need to really refine if you're to um, learn as much as you possibly can. Consolidation is dependent upon many, many factors. The emotional context is very important in terms of memory consolidation. For example, um, we know that patients who have had very um, traumatic experiences with a high emotional content actually may lay down memories extremely vividly. Uh, and this can, in its extreme, can lead to conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder. So the emotional context of learning is very important in terms of the way that memories are laid down and subsequently retrieved. Rehearsal is a key feature. Now, many of you use techniques such as flashcards, um, writing notes, that kind of thing. And all of these things are um, helping you to rehearse what you know. The more you can go over something, the easier it becomes to get into long-term memory. And finally, association. Association is something we are always doing. But, for example, you can maybe think about association in the context of anatomy, uh, where you might associate the uh, visual appearance of an anatomical structure with its name. You might associate that with its function. You might associate that with its nerve supply. So association, this ability of us to create links between memories, is also very important to help to keep these memories stored long term. So this is the storage of memories, and we'll talk a little bit more about the cellular and molecular basis a little bit later on. Now, if we're thinking about declarative memories, the region that we really need to focus on, and the region that all of you um, get lots of practice in exercising, is the hippocampus. The hippocampus sits deep within the temporal lobe, but around about this level here. And it's called the hippocampus on account of its resemblance to a seahorse. Now, it's, it's, to, it's said to resemble a seahorse in many different views of the brain. Um, but this one, what they've done is actually taken the whole hippocampus out and tried to show its curved shape the, to, to remind us it looks like the curved shape of the seahorse. Now, the hippocampus is a very important site of association, <clears throat> and it receives input from multiple regions of the brain. It receives input from the visual system, the auditory system, the somatosensory system, as well as the limbic system, so it can associate emotions with all these other inputs as well. It associates these inputs, and then what it's able to do is through a reverberatory circuit between itself and the cerebral cortex, it is able to induce long-term potentiation within the synapses of the cortex in order to help us to lay down long-term memories. Now, we know a lot <coughs> excuse me, about the hippocampus. Thanks to one particular patient, this gentleman here on the left-hand side was the patient who used to be known as H.M., but this is Henry Malayson. Henry Malayson, as a young man, suffered from epilepsy. Epilepsy that was so severe um, that he ended up having to have um, a very um, extensive treatment for it performed by a neurosurgeon. 
It was found that Henry Mollison's epilepsy was originating in his hippocampus, but at the time they didn't have methods of knowing which side of the brain it was coming from. Was it the left hippocampus or the right hippocampus? And so what the surgeon did was in fact remove both hippocampi. And in removing both of Henry Mollison's hippocampi, he cured his epilepsy. Sadly, he left him with a very, very significant disability. And that was that Henry Mollison became unable to lay down new declarative memories. So, for example, you know, for the rest of his life, he was studied um, by psychologists. But every time he went to the laboratory of the psychologists, they had to introduce themselves because he couldn't remember who they were. So this guy was cured of his epilepsy, but sadly um, w was um, deprived of his ability to lay down long-term memories. And he was key to our, under our modern understanding of the function of the hippocampus. On the flip side is, is this chap here, Solomon Shereshevsky, who was a Russian... Uh, and was um, studied by the uh, psychologist Salvador Luria. Shereshevsky was interesting because he had a, a pretty much perfect memory. It is said that he was able to remember pretty much every detail of what had ever happened to him. So, to give you one example, Luria um, one day gave him a very long, complex mathematical expression and said, memorise this, which Shereshevsky uh, diligently did. And then he, 20 years later, he was asked to recall that mathematical expression, and lo and behold, he was able to do that perfectly accurately. So Solomon Shereshevsky had a perfect memory, all right? And of course, most of us sit somewhere between these two extremes. Um, and it's well worth doing a bit more reading on both of these characters. So that's just a little bit on the hippocampus. Clearly the hippocampus was overactive in the case of Solomon Shereshevsky. Finally, let's just consider um, what might be the cellular and molecular mechanisms of uh, memory consolidation. Um, and this is all down to a mechanism called long-term potentiation, which I know some of you have encountered briefly in some of your previous lectures. Essentially, what we can think of is the presynaptic neuron here and the postsynaptic neuron there. And we can think of these as creating an association. So if they both become active simultaneously, then that is an association. That would be a memory in the process of being formed. If both of these start to fire together and an association needs to be created, what we find is a couple of things. First, the presynaptic neuron grows more terminals which impinge upon the postsynaptic neuron. And furthermore, these terminals will release more neurotransmitter and there are also more neurotransmitters expressed as well within the synapse. So um, this has been known for quite some time. A lot of it was elucidated by uh, a guy who won the Nobel Prize called Eric Kandel. And he used the sea slug as his model organism just because its nervous system was quite simple and easily tractable. Uh, but this is the molecular basis of, of the way that our memory um, works, really. Of course, it's a little bit more of a stretch of the imagination to understand how synaptic strengths can represent concepts or motor skills, um, but that's where the complexity of neural networks comes in um, to help us appreciate that. So that's all I wanted to talk about on memory. Thank you for listening.